The next thing we're going to look at now that we've done some assembly and C programming refreshers are some of the background concepts we need to start talking about memory corruption and vulnerabilities. So we're going to be touching on things from operating systems and systems programming, CPU architecture, and a few other courses. First off, I want you to sort of quiz yourself. Right? So we'll, we'll, we'll imagine a scenario. Um, again, remember that what you can about C, data structures, OS, assembly. And think about this question. Assume that a user has a standard Hello World program that they wrote in C and compiled it into something called Hello.out or Hello.exe or whatever you want to call it. Try to imagine in as much detail as possible what happens when they run that program from the command line in Linux. So the idea is that I, you know, so imagine everything that happens from when I hit enter to when it prints that message and exits. That's what I want you to, to think about. Um, and for simplicity's sake, ignore the concept of the, you know, the scheduler that's going to be swapping processes in and out, or some of the lower level memory concepts like cache misses and stuff like that. Um, just think about from a process perspective and from a high level memory perspective, what happens. Pause the video, think about it, see if you can puzzle it out, and then come back and we'll sort of talk through it. Okay, so here's some of the things that hopefully you came up with, or hopefully you remember some of these things as we start to go through it. First thing that happens obviously when you press enter is that the shell is going to read that string from standard in, which was hello.out. It's sort of going to parse that along with any command line arguments. You know, our hello world program didn't have any, but we can imagine that a program has some sort of arguments in the command line as well. Then the shell tries to locate that program first using all of the um, strings that are in the user's path environment variable. So if I were to echo path, you know, I've got stuff like slash home, slash Nick, um, slash user, slash local, slash bin, stuff like that. And it's going to look for the executable in those locations. Or if you provided an absolute path, it's going to find the executable there. Once the parent process knows where the executable is, it can then spawn a child process, right? So we can call fork, which is going to uh, create a child process and establish a new virtual address space or, uh, you know, sort of a new memory layout for that child process. Initially, from your operating systems course, the child process has a virtual address space that's identical to the parents because, you know, we do the whole copy on write thing. Then inside the child, while the parent process waits for its completion, the child's going to call uh, like exec VE, which is the system call that can launch um, a process from a, you know, a program uh, that we have in a file somewhere. So it's going to call exec VE on hello.out. What will happen is all of the data and the instructions inside of that compiled program. Um, so all the code, all the data, all the variables, all the strings, all that kind of stuff is parsed out of the executable and loaded into the child's virtual address space. In a little bit, we'll look at where that content is located because that's going to be important for us moving forward. Then any of the command line parameters to that program get pushed onto the stack inside of that child process. Remember, every process maintains a region of memory that it calls the stack, and that's where we store things like variables. And again, we'll be working with that later. While the child's doing that, the parent process calls wait, right? which is what a, you know, in a multi-process environment we do until a child process terminates or finishes execution. So while the parent's waiting, the child needs to begin execution in that program that it just loaded. Right? The first instruction we typically call the entry point. Normally, in some of the header fields of our compiled program, there's going to be a field that tells the system where to start executing. Um, if you remember, you know, from writing C code, your program typically starts at the first line of code in your main function. And it's very similar. Think of this as we're telling the OS where main is and it's going to start execution at that location. Okay. When our hello world program finishes, meaning like it says hello.out and then it calls exit or it returns, right? That process passes a return value um, back to the parent, either a value of zero if it was successful or some kind of error code if it wasn't. Uh, then the child process terminates and it sort of frees up or, or opens up or deallocates the virtual address space that was assigned to it. At that point, the wait system call finishes and the shell is then ready to receive the next command from the user, right? So it will print the prompt on standard out and then sit there and wait for the user to type in the next command. That's essentially what happens uh, as you run a program. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the execution sort of of a program and we're going to see if we can find some of those system calls and get an idea of some of the various components of an executable that get loaded into memory. 
For this demo and the next few examples, we're going to be using the same program. So first I'm going to show you how that program works. So this is sort of a just an, a, an example or demo or trivial C program to demonstrate a few concepts that we're going to be talking about as we explore memory corruption and vulnerabilities. So at the top, we've just got some standard imports like standard IO, standard lib, and the string library. Um, we've got a, a constant here called name length and four functions. So we'll start down in main. Um, first main calls read name. Um, so we'll go to read name. In read name, we create a string that's name len, name len characters long. We set all of the characters to zero inside that string or the null byte. Then we prompt the user to enter their name and we read that string into the name variable. Uh, we're going to see later on that this line here is our vulnerability, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, then we echo the name back to the user, uh, and then we would return to main here. Then we call get number and assign its return value to num. So if we look up in get number, we create an integer, assign, it to zero, assign the value to zero. Um, we prompt the user to enter a number. We scan an integer and we return that. So then we've got some number populated here. Then we dynamically allocate an integer array called fibnums um, based on you know the number that the user gave us. So if they gave us five, we would allocate um, a five element integer array called fibnums. Uh, once we do that, we enter into a for loop that runs from zero to less than num times and where we assign um, the position at fibnums equal to the output of fib at i. So if we go up, you probably already know what this is going to be at this point, but whatever. Um, so fib takes an integer x and basically computes the Fibonacci function recursively, right? So if um, we recurse down to the point where x is 0 or 1, we just return the value 1. Otherwise, we return the output of fib of x minus 1 plus fib of x minus 2. Uh, so once we've calculated and populated the array of the Fibonacci numbers up to that point, we tell the user what they're about to see, and then we print those numbers back, and then we exit successfully. So that's the sort of the program that we're going to use. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to do is just show you some of the things we can see by tracing a program. So um, I've already compiled this, but uh, I might as well show you the make file now. Um, here's the make file. There's a single target called build that requires simple.c. Uh, this make file creates a 32-bit executable, adds some extra debugging code for GDB, doesn't do any optimizations, disables a couple of memory protections uh, that we're going to be talking about later, uses the C11C standard, and spits out a program called simple.out. Okay, so um, if we run it just to see it work, So we know the program works. Now what we want to do is trace the program to see, you know, when we run a program on the command line, what are some of the system calls that happen? Because like I said in, in the lecture, we should see stuff like a call to exec and stuff like that. So we can run a utility called strace. Um, if this is not installed by default, you have to, you know, apt install strace. And we run it on simple.out. And then we see a whole bunch of stuff start to happen. So if we scroll up here, um, we see a call to exec VE uh, where the argument is simple.out. So this is actually you know loading um, this program from disk into memory and you know uh, then executing the, the program. Uh, a couple other things that are interesting to note, we see here like a call to the read system call. This is probably reading content from the file. Um, it's actually reading the header of the executable. We can see that. We see the characters here, ELF or ELF. Okay. Uh, a couple other uh, things that happen. We see some mmap calls. This is mapping usually the contents of a file into memory somewhere. So this is us basically assigning content from the executable into memory in preparation for executing the program. There's also a few calls to mprotect, which set various permissions on regions of memory. Remember, in Linux, everything is a file. So we can treat regions of memory the same way we treat files. We can assign them similar permissions like, you know, um, read only, read write, read write execute, things like that. And we'll talk later on about why we would want to do that. 
Then we actually get down into the program itself. Um, so at this point, the program is executing. We see here it's issuing the write system call to file handle number one, which is standard out. Um, we see the string that it wants to print and the length of that string. That's the standard write system call, which you know by calling printf, we have, would have eventually boiled down to. We actually see the output of that right here. And then it sort of resumes. Then it, now it's sitting at the read system call, which is where we would have um, asked the user to enter a string. And so that's, that's sort of um, walking through um, the execution of this. We could enter a string. We see another call to write where we print the string, another call to write where we ask the user to enter a number, so five, and uh, a couple more calls to write as we you know, print the final values for the user, and eventually a call to the exit um, system call that should terminate the process. And now we're presented with the prompt again since the parent process or the shell is ready to accept the next command. And that's it.